it is all in vain. It will all come to nothing. A tale of two sisters. Pride and Prejudice continues Sunday at 9 on BBC One. Crime Watch UK, now on BBC One with Nick Ross and Jill Dando. Cases resulted in arrests. News on one came in just at lunchtime today from the Southeast Regional Crime Squad. Now they've recovered the complete collection of Bernard Leach's stolen pottery. You may remember that it was taken from his museum in St. Ives, Cornwall, in the first week of August. Well, three men are now in custody. There's been a spate of child attacks during the summer, tragic cases all across the country. Tonight we cover four of them. Now, in fact, most are unconnected. It's just a sad coincidence. The headlines all seem to come together. You may be surprised to know that the rate of child murder by strangers has remained pretty much stable since the Second World War, at an average of about five a year. Even so, when a child is attacked, it naturally provokes a special sense of outrage, apart from which there's a real risk the offender will strike again. So tonight, we've been asked to appeal on two linked cases, which were among the summer headlines and which are still unsolved. These were abductions in which, mercifully, the children survived. Both occurred on Tyneside, one on Thursday the 4th of May and one on Monday the 4th of September. We've put together all the clues into a Crime Watch jigsaw. In the next few minutes, we hope viewers will supply the missing pieces. First, though, we need witnesses. This is the Moulton Place shopping centre in Blakelaw, Newcastle. On Thursday evening, the 4th of May, a man spoke to a five-year-old girl here on the pavement. He was tall, slim, with short black hair, wearing dark trousers and, we think, a blue shirt. He said to the girl, will you come and look for my dog? She walked with him towards a white car parked here, and then he pushed her into it. The child was sexually assaulted and later abandoned. That car was possibly a four-door saloon type with a scrape on the front door. Almost certainly, the same man abducted another child on Monday, the 4th of September. This is a mile and a half away from Blakelaw in the Arthur's Hill area of Newcastle. At about 5 p.m., a man was seen here in Prospect Place and again in Clarewood Green. People thought he looked a bit suspicious, so maybe you remember him. He was 35 to 45, average height, medium to heavy build, with thick, dark, untidy hair. He was wearing a distinctive lumberjack shirt with large grey and white checks and dark, flared, dirty trousers. By ten past six, he'd moved across Stanhope Street into the New Mills estate. At seven o'clock, he was seen hanging around the Moorside School playing field. At five past seven, he'd moved further round the path to here. And by 7.30, he was in Darnall Place, where he was seen with a four-year-old girl. That child was abducted and sexually assaulted. The child remembers he had a car. Both children were driven 40 miles to Darlington. Now, he seems to have had access to a house or flat in the town. Maybe he lives there or perhaps have, has relatives there. In May, the girl was abandoned on the outskirts of Darlington. That was after midnight, so whoever abducted her would have been unaccounted for all that evening on Thursday, the 4th of May. The second child was kept for 17 hours before being dumped in Bulmer Square at lunchtime on Tuesday, the 5th of September. As with the first abduction, this is on the north side of Darlington. If you have any suspicions, even if it's someone close to home, please call. We can't let these terrible crimes happen again. Officers on the case are here, 0500 600 600, there's the number. We have 40 lines here to the studio, and the call will cost you nothing. 0500 600 600. Alternatively, you can call the instant room in Newcastle, that's on 0191 221 8373. That's uh, Tyneside on Newcastle, 221 8373. Let's hope we have the same success with that as we did with some of our last month's cases. 
Remember the damage done to the solicitor's house in Warwick. No one knew a motive, but 15 callers gave the same name. A man has been arrested, and it turns out that eight years ago, he was turned down for a job by the solicitor. Also, a man was wanted in connection with some paedophile offences, and several viewers helped police to find him. He's been charged with 29 sexual crimes. And another suspect was recognised and traced to Brighton in Sussex, where he was arrested the morning following the programme. He's been charged with 50 offences. Now to a new appeal. Do you know this man? He's white, about 50, six foot of average build, with dark hair greying at the sides and a London accent. In addition, he wears gold jewellery, carries a mobile phone and smokes a brand of cigarettes called Barclay. He has connections with an audio business. Now, can you fit that face to this handwriting? And finally, have a listen to this voice. Forget it, bloody cowboy outfit. Forget it, bloody cowboy outfit. This man needs to be eliminated. It could be the voice of a man who is travelling around England swindling audio shops. Somehow, he gets to know their banking detail and then uses unwitting taxi drivers to draw out the money on his behalf using forged documents. If you're a retailer or a taxi driver or work in a bank, keep an eye out for this man. And if you've come across him, do please call. The local police are on 01473 613 833. That's Ipswich 613 833. Now to a terrible crime that made headlines just six weeks ago, the killing of Louise Sellers. Now Louise was 15. She lived in Apley Bridge near Wigan with her parents and younger brother and sister. Louise was an absolutely fun-loving girl. She loved to go out with her mates. She loved to have a dance on a Friday night. She was doing really well at school. She had a life planned out to be a PE teacher. Um, she was going to uh, college. And she had everything set. Everything set. Oh, she was bubbly. Um, vivacious, I would say. It describes the to a T, really. She was uh, everybody's friend. And you could not fail to like Louise. You know, she was, I'm not saying she was an angel. She was just like every other teenager. But she just had that bit more. What are you looking for? Sure. Oh, what about those there? Dad. I'm trying. Listen, I'm not feeling too well. I think I'm going to go up. Right. Can you do the washing up for me, Louise? All right. You're going to go out tonight? I'm going to find some friends who might meet up. Well, don't be too long on that phone, will you? Hello? Hi. Oh, Louise. Do you want to meet up? This evening? Yeah, tell you what, we'll meet at the late shop and we can walk down. Yeah, OK. Uh, what time? Well, what's best for you? Uh, 6.30. All right. I've got loads of gossip to tell you. No, not now. You'll have to wait. <laughs> Dad, his mum's still asleep. Yeah, probably, why? Just want some money. Well, I think she is still sleeping, so don't you be waking up. Louise, come back. Mum? Mm hmm? Can I have some money? How much? Just a quid for a couple of cans of coke. Mm. Where are you going? Just to meet some friends. Okay, I'll see you later. Yeah. See ya. Right, bye. See ya. Hiya. How are ya? All right. What's the gossip then? Well, I went to the park nightclub on Friday. Oh yeah. <laughs> There's a fight bouncer standing in the queue. What? Next to you? Yeah. These guys were trying to get in the club, but the bouncers wouldn't let them in. But you got in though, didn't you? Yeah. I ended up falling out with Jane though. Why? She just really got me nerves. Please, have you moved the sugar? Because I trapped off with this guy called Andrew, and he gave me his ring. I'm going to give it him back tonight, though. I was supposed to give it him back before we left the club, but I just forgot. Yeah. Hiya. Hiya. Where you go? Yeah. Where have you been? What, what? Where are you going? It's quiet up now. I was 
It's just that Auntie and the girlfriend wants to go to Guinness. Come on, get in. We're only going to Aunt's house. No, not tonight. I'm too tired. Well, where are you off to? I think I'll go home. See ya. It's about 9.15pm and Kelly presumed Louise was going home. But ten minutes later... Hiya. Michelle, you're never going to believe what's just happened. What? I was standing at the bus stop at Randall's corner and this bloke pulls up in his car and asked me if I want a lift. So I said no. He tells me to get lost and calls me a slag. Are you kidding? No. It's now around 9.30. I was travelling along Miles Lane when I noticed Louise on the right-hand side of the road. She was walking in between Chiseka Drive and Aberdale, heading towards Randall's Corner. Five minutes later, a local resident saw what appeared to be Louise standing by the bus stop, talking to two men in a white Ford Escort. Moments later, just up the road, Was this the same white car, and was Louise inside? Oh, I hate people, people like that, don't they annoy you? What time did you tell Louise she had to be in? Well, Sunday, she'd normally back by half past ten, and now it's... Nearly eleven. Louise was very good at she coming was. home, but if she was going to be any later, she would always ring us um, to let us know where she was and what time she was going to be in. So, obviously, when she didn't ring or, or let us know by eleven o'clock where she was, that's when we really did start to worry. Oh, hi. It's Elaine Sellers here. Um, you haven't seen Louise, have you, tonight? No, no, and she hasn't come back yet. It's um, Elaine Sellers here, uh, Louise's mum. I I'm sorry to bother you at this time of night. I know it's a bit late. Elaine Sellers here. Yes, um, has your daughter seen Louise tonight at all? We we j I just wondered if you'd seen her at all tonight. Oh, I am, I am. I mean, do you think, who else can I ring? Hello, is that Mrs. Morrissey? Hello, it, it's Elaine Sellers here, Louise's mum. Um, is Kelly in by any chance? Yeah, yeah, could I have a word with her? Could you ask her if she's seen Louise tonight? Kelly. Mm -hmm. Louise's mum's on the phone. She wants to know what time you left, Louise. She's not come in yet. 9, 9.20. Why? What time is it now? It's nearly midnight. Has she gone missing before? Never. She'd never leave us worrying like this. Where's your husband at the moment? Louise! Louise! Could you circulate that description, please? Thank you. Don't worry, there's lots of officers looking for her. There's definitely something wrong. Early the next morning, Louise's body was discovered near Billinge, five miles from her home. She'd been strangled. The tragic fate of Louise Sellers. Well, Peter Mockett is in charge of the inquiry. Peter, in addition to the two white cars we saw in the film, I think you have new information on a third white car, which may or may not be the same one. Maybe right? the same one, yes. We have a sighting of a white Ford Escort uh, with a fin on the back, which was seen in Miles Lane around about half past nine. The driver's described as 21 years of age with facial stubble, and he's wearing some distinctive clothing. Yes, I think he was wearing a baseball cap rather like this, wasn't he? Blue and red. A blue blue cap with a red coat, with, with a red, red peak. peak rather, and yeah. also a T-shirt with a distinctive marking on it as yes, well. Yes, it's got no fear on it, the black T-shirt with no fear written on it. And you presumably desperately want to trace Louise's movements after 9.30. Very much so. We've got plenty of sightings up until 9.30. It's drastically important that we find where she went after 9.30. Now, the scene where her body was found in Billinge is a popular place, isn't it, for walkers caught in couples? It is. We'd appeal to anyone who was in, in the vicinity on the evening of the 13th or into the early hours of the 14th who was about who saw anything remotely suspicious, vehicles of people. Some items found in the area. Tell us about these. This yes, this is a cassette tape which was found quite near to Lu where Louise was found. As you can see, it's got a handwritten label on either side. Goon May 93 is on one side and Vertigo on the other. It wasn't Louise's. And another cassette case, I think. Yes, that was found in the location. Tenerife Holiday, it's called. We know that it was produced in Tenerife this year. 
were desperately keen to find the owners of those two cassette tapes. Now, the person who committed this dreadful crime must have acted strange afterwards. You can only imagine so. It's a terrible, grave crime, the loss of a young girl's wife. If anyone knows anything, if the person's confided in a family member or a partner, please come forward, please tell us. It's desperately important. Absolutely, Peter. Thank you very much indeed. And I just must add that there is a substantial reward offered in this case as well. So if you feel that you can help police in any way, you can call them direct on 0161 856 7085. That's Manchester, 0161 856 7085. Next, a sequence of pictures taken in the capital. This is a video from London Bridge Station. Note the woman in the right-hand corner. She's just missed her last train home, and after waiting 15 minutes for a taxi, she goes to a phone box to call a minicab. Now look at this man, who remained in the queue. Why has he decided to take off his glasses and put them in his pocket? Next, we see him pretending to make a phone call adjacent to the woman. And now, as she emerges from the phone box, he follows her and jabs her with something sharp. He tried to frog march her out of the station, saying, if you know what's best for you, don't say a word, just come with me. She sensibly shouts out and a railway official comes to her aid. Now the man heads off either to the street or to the underground. He's in his twenties, average height with light brown bushy hair. His glasses were metal framed. Who is he? Help trace him urgently. The local police are on 0171 380 1400. That's 0171 380 1400. Last year, a crime watch reconstruction looked at the murder of Julie Pacey, a mother of two who was murdered at a home in Grantham in Lincolnshire. You may remember that she told her husband a man had come to the door three days before asking for directions. The results of our appeal were rather disappointing, but now uh, new clues have emerged. Detective Superintendent Roger Billingsley has asked us to come back to the case with the new information. First of all, I know you're now convinced that that man who came to her door on Friday was the man who came back after the weekend on Monday. We've got a fairly good uh, description of him. I think there's an e-fit of him, and that's somebody who's got to be traced. But there's a new piece of information as well, and that is uh, to do with a watch. Now, this man may have this watch. So just tell us about this, can you? Yes, the, the watch was, uh, or watch similar to that, was found on Julie. We know that she was wearing it on the day she was killed. We traced it back to uh, Paris when she was there in August, about a month before she was murdered. It's called a Luc de Roche Quartz. It's a French watch made, manufactured and distributed in France and not in the UK. And there aren't very many around then? No, there should be very few in the UK. Now, if people have got one, have seen one, what do you want them to do? Please ring in. Uh, there well, are anybody so, who's got one of these. Yes, indeed. There are so few of them that I would like to speak to anybody who can recognise that watch. Why has it taken you a year to find that Julie's watch was missing? We, I knew about it uh, before this, of course. Uh, I'd hoped to find it on the offender. It's now uh, a year on, as you've mentioned. It's the anniversary. Um, that chance is not likely. Okay, Mr. Billingsley, thank you very much indeed. If there's any way that uh, you can help, please call, particularly if you can place this watch with that face. Here's the free call number. As usual, you can call the local instant room if you prefer. That's on 01476 62501. That's Grantham 62501. This is a picture of a man to beware of. He's Brian Fontaine, 42, 6 foot 1, swarthy, and look at those tattoos. They're on his arms, fingers, chest, and even his left ear. Here's another picture of him, this time without his moustache. After being charged with a string of very serious offences, he escaped from custody. He's thought to be especially dangerous to women whom he befriends, suddenly undergoing a complete change in character. If you see him, please don't approach him. Call us or ring South Shields Police on 0191 510 That's Tyneside, 510 Now, how can you be sure the taxi you get into is bona fide? It's often hard to know, and there are attempts at the moment to tighten up the law. But one thing is clear, only licensed cabs are allowed to pick up passengers who hail them in the street. This is one of the reasons why. It's the story of someone in the West End of London who got into a car that appeared to be a minicab. 
The car was a maroon hatchback. The driver spoke with a Cockney accent, but there may have been a hint of Italian. Perhaps you too have been a passenger of his, or indeed, was he a genuine cab driver? Go on, get out. And no funny business. Hello, love. Do you have a nice... Something dreadful's happened. What? I... I got into a minicab. And? And the driver... forced me to have sex with him. Oh, darling. Earlier that evening, Anne had been out for a drink with friends in Soho. At 11 o'clock, she left the pub and walked up to Oxford Street to hail a taxi home. There was a few black cabs that went past first, um, and then this guy in his minicab drove up. Draw a cab. He had proper minicab stuff, like he had a logo on the door and he had the ID badge on the, his rear view mirror. Where have you been tonight then? I've been out with my mates for a couple of drinks. When I noticed the ID card hanging on the rear view mirror behind it, it was green, Christmas tree shaped, magic tree air freshener. What do you do? I'm a nurse. Oh, yeah. All nurses are supposed to be right goers, aren't they? Yeah, I bet you wear them little white uniforms, don't you, like they do up at Whips Cross? That's my local hospital. Well, when he started going on about nurses, I mean, that irritates me, because you get that a lot, um, being a nurse, but... My main feeling about the cab driver was that he was a bit slimy at this stage. At the junction by the World's End pub at the top of Camden High Street, Anne expected the driver to turn right towards Finsbury Park. Instead, he drove straight on. Where are we going? Shall we turn right down there? Look, shut up, bitch. Please, just take me home, please. Look, shut up. I've got money in my bag. I've got enough money for you. Just, just take it. I don't want your stupid money. What I remember most is I could hear my heartbeat in my ears. And there's a time when I realised I wasn't breathing and that I should breathe again. I was really scared. I mean, I really was really scared, like I'd not really felt before in my life. I knew that it wasn't going to be a ride home. Whatever it was that was going to happen, he wasn't taking me home. They drove along Prince Albert Road, past the aviary in London Zoo. On the front seat, there was a copy of Today newspaper and some Benson and Hess cigarettes. And in the door compartment next to the passenger seat, there was one of those large steel ring bound A to Zs of London. Yeah, all of you are exactly the same. All goers, ain't you? All you nurses. <laughs> if you just let me out of this car, I, I promise I won't say a word to anybody. Please, just let me out in this... Shut this... up. Just shut up, bitch. That's right. All nurses. All of you. Right go, isn't you? My most vivid thought at the time was that he was going to kill me, to be honest. I thought I was dead. I just didn't know how he was going to do it, and my mind was racing as to how he would do it and would I suffer, and how the, the people I loved would take it. I 
I bet you've seen loads of men. I've got a, I've got a knife in my bag. <laughs> <laughs> and it was then that I knew that he was going to rape me. After he finished, he held my face to look him straight in the eye for about, about 30 seconds, probably. I was expecting to feel a knife or for him to start strangling me because he'd let me see him. Right. Take your own then, shall I? <laughs> Since the attack, I've been much more of a withdrawn person. I used to be really proud to tell people I was a nurse, but I'm not anymore because it, maybe it wouldn't have happened in my mind if I had have had a different job. And one thing that really scares me is that there's going to be a next time, I think, with this guy, and next time he might kill someone. I just really, really want for him to be caught. That's all I want. A very brave girl to recall events like that. Detective Sergeant Steve Lodge, how is she now? She's recovering slowly, but obviously it's going to take some time. How did she describe her attacker? He's a Mediterranean-looking man in his 30s, and he has a very distinctive mole to the right side of his nose, just above his mouth. He's also got a large hooped earring in his left ear, and when he talks, he hisses his s's. Now, any clues as to where he may be from? When he was talking to the victim, he mentioned Whips Cross Hospital as being his local hospital. That's an area in Essex, just to the east of London. He also said they had relatives or friends uh, in the east end of London, Whitechapel, uh, and he seemed to know northwest London, North London very well. What information do you have on the car? We know it's a maroon hatchback, don't we? It's a maroon hatchback or saloon car with this very distinctive logo on the side of it, a club sign, which may or may not be genuine. So how do you know when you hail a taxi in the street, as of course this nurse did, thinking it to be bona fide, how do you know if it is for real? The only vehicles that can stop and pick you up are licensed taxis, and they'll carry a, a cab sign, a taxi sign, or a for hire sign with a license plate on, on usually on the back um, if any other vehicle stops just don't get into it great advice steve thank you very much indeed well as the victim said of course that man could strike again so if there's anything you know or anything that you can add there's the number a free call here to the studio of course or you can ring the incident room direct on 0181 733 6031 that's 0181 733 6031 please call if you can help it looked as though it was going to be very quiet tonight. The phones uh, really weren't ringing for quite a time, but now it's ferocious here. Um, on the Newcastle child abductions, we've got four names, uh, which are quite uh, intriguing, I'm told, and uh, possibly some other incidents. And uh, audio shock con man, we've got two people giving the same name. A lot of other information coming in, too. Let me tell you about a case that we featured early last year, that of the Olympic swimming coach, Paul Hickson. He'd been charged with sexual offences and had fled the country. As a result of our appeal, several more victims came forward, and the case against him was very much stronger. As you may have seen in the news, he's now been sentenced to 17 years. This face was one that we showed in May, holding up a building society in Blackburn. A viewer identified him, and when they checked his pictures against another armed robbery in Preston, they found a perfect match. He's now been convicted of both crimes. He got nine years. Now, another picture, this time of a suspected blackmailer and con man. His real name is Christopher Harrison, though he uses all sorts of aliases. This is what he sounds like. What are the choices am I left with? I have not, if I had another business to walk along and say, oh, well, I've put it down to experience, I'll do that. I cannot walk away with anything else. I've got nothing else in the bag apart from threats now. He's 26, and not long ago, he was in Kent and London. Now, we know that because, unwittingly, he left a clue. But I'm afraid we can't tell you what it is. If you know where he is, you can contact the local police on 01234 271 212. That's Bedford 271 212. Now, if you work in a post office, you'll be interested in this cheque. You might even recognise it. After all, it's been presented for payment 548 times. This is the woman who used it, and this is one of the few times post office staff have challenged her. Here she is in March in rugby. Her hair looks longer. And here she is in early August, this time in Cambridge. If you do work in a post office, always check that there's a watermark on gyro checks. And make sure the paper feels right too. If you've any information on this woman, you can contact the local police on 01223 
323-929. Now that's Cambridge, 323-929. And now, an appeal by a victim of a crime. The widow of Tony Sullivan has asked to come into the studio tonight and make a plea about his murder. Tony was 36, and on Friday night, the 18th of August, he went to the Lotus nightclub in Forest Gate. Around 3 o'clock in the morning, as he was leaving, Tony was stabbed to death. Well, Debbie, thank you very much for coming in. It takes a, a brave woman to do something like this. Can you think of any reason why anyone should do like this to Tony? No, I can't think of anybody that would have a reason because most people Tony knew, they liked him. He was so well liked and well respected by people. I can't think of any reason that anybody would want to do this to Tony. Now, Detective Inspector Colette Paul, you're in charge of the inquiry. Has um, anyone yes. come forward with any information? Because it was a busy nightclub, wasn't That's it? That's right. It was a very busy nightclub that night. And what I'm looking for is witnesses who actually saw Tony in the nightclub that evening, witnesses who saw him leave the nightclub, um, outside of the nightclub, and in addition to that, a special attempt for witnesses to come forward um, who, have, who have actually made contact with the police and with the local press. You now, have had calls. we have had calls, and we do know that these people clearly saw the murder, and I've really asked those people to come forward and tell us all they know. Do you think people are perhaps slightly afraid? They're f afraid of the repercussions? Mm. I think people may be frightened, and what I'd say to them is there's all sorts of things we can do to offer them protection, but obviously I would need to discuss that with those individuals. Debbie, what would you like to say to someone who may be harbouring this particular individual and they're afraid to come forward? Well. What I'd like to say to them is that if they have children of their own and they see the effect that Tony's death has had on my children, um, I've got three children, Lucy's ten, Tom's five and Joe's two, and Lucy and Tom cry so much over their dad, and it doesn't matter, whatever I do to them, I can never make it better for them. All the cuddles in the world and the love will never ever bring their dad back, and he was such a main part of their life. And I just feel, please, if anybody's watching, and you know, please come forward and just help help catch the person that did this to Tony. Well, thank you very thank much. You. Well, you've, you've heard what Debbie said. Please, if you can help in any way, do ring us here now. Or, of course, you can call the Incident Room Direct on 0181 217 5432. That's 0181 217 5432. Since the peace process began, Northern Ireland has seen economic revival and a tourist boom. In late July, thousands of visitors were in County Antrim, basking in the sunshine, playing golf, walking in the rolling hills, and visiting the Giants' Causeway. Now, if you were there, on Friday, July the 28th, please watch what follows closely. You might help solve the murder of 13-year-old Darren Fawns. Your sister gave me four pounds for doing her lawn. And look, I fixed your heads as well. Thanks, Miss Simpson. And remember, if there's anything you ever need doing, just ask. He never ever went to Andy and asked him for money for nothing. He always used to want to earn that money. And that was one of the main ways he'd done it, was doing gardening for them. He was very outgoing and friendly. Very friendly. My mother sent him a T-shirt from England with dolphins on the front. And there was a pensioner that was behind us. And she seen Dan in the T-shirt. And she liked it. So Dan came home, took it off, put on another T-shirt, and gave the pensioner a T-shirt he was wearing, the one with the dolphins. That's the sort of boy he was. He always used to come up and say, would you, do you want a cup of tea, Mummy? You know, and just to bring me a cup of tea up, or if I couldn't do something, I'll do that for you. The other way. No, the other way. Oh, Darren, over a bit. No, the next ones. Yes, those. Them? Oh, come on, Mum. I'd be embarrassed if you wore these in public. Look, these are much nicer. OK, bring them over. On the evening of Friday, July the 28th, Darren and his mother went to the Castle Shopping Centre in Antrim Town. Sorry. After I got the shoes, 
would put them in the Stuart's bag that I have my bingo board in and he carried it up the shopping centre for me out to the arcade there and I says I'll take that son of your right and he says I'm okay mum I says well I'll see you just after 10 between 10 and 10 past thanks see you Tom don't be late Hey PJ, what you doing? Hey Fonzie. What are you doing tonight then? Waiting on the bus to Belfast. Supposed to be here half an hour ago. Can I have a smoke? Oh come on PJ, don't be stingy. Police need help in tracing this boy who was hanging around with Darren. He was standing looking around him and just looking about. He was roughly around the same age as Darren, black hair, blackish clothes. And I've never really seen him before. What about you, Fans? Oh, right fit. Hey, was that your mummy I saw you with earlier on the shops? Yep. Darren seemed very happy the night I was talking to him. He was his chatty, usual, smiling self. So he was just as nice as he always has been to me. Darren, or Fonzie to his friends, spent much of that afternoon and evening in the town's amusement arcade, known locally as the Pleasure Drome or Roller Drome. <laughs> Granddad, I don't like this one. Your money in that one. It's bust. This was about half an hour before Darren was due to meet his mother. You don't try any of them either. I've lost money in them. Here we fell. I'll show you the nudges you need. Okay, here we go. Right, push start. That one. Okay, and again. Right, one other place here. Right, see, put more money in. I didn't know Darren, but he seemed so kind and gentle. And him and Jonathan, my grandson, got on like a house on fire, and I felt quite free to leave him and go and have a cup of coffee. Thank you very much. In the next half hour or so, Darren must have met somebody else. But who? His mother waited at the cab rank as agreed, but by 10 past 10, Darren still hadn't shown. Look, uh, maybe he's still at the roller drum. Uh, could you take me round there on the way round? I can, surely, yes. Go ahead. I was worried. Because if he said he was going to be there, he would be there. Yet, 30 minutes later, as the roller drone closed, Darren was seen leaving. Right, Fawn, see you tomorrow. All right, I'll do. Two boys, both roughly his age. Who were they? And where were they going? Five days later, a mile from the town centre, a Belgian tourist searching for a ball found Darren lying in bushes between the golf course and a holiday caravan site. Darren had been struck on the head. Those two lads who left the roller drone with him are obviously key witnesses. They're not suspects. We need them to come forward tonight urgently. And Mr Kincaid, what else is there? I mean, you wanted a national appeal on this. Yes, sir. Well, one of the important things is the caravan site. 
Uh, it's called the Six Mile Water Caravan Park. The, the locals call it the Loch Shore Caravan Park. On the 28th to the 30th of July, there was a considerable amount of caravans and tents at that park. Many of the people there came from Great Britain, and Darren's body was found only a few yards away in a, in a wood. Now, if you were there, I would ask you to please to call us at Antrim or call us here. That's the very end of July, 28th, 28th to 30th, 30th of July. July. Yes, and you may have heard or seen something which to you is very insignificant, but could be important to us to find the killer. So even if you don't think you saw anything related to this, you want them to call? If you stayed at that caravan park, please call us. Now, these are Darren's shoes. And they weren't found with his body, they were handed into you. What's the significance of these and how can viewers help? Well, those shoes were recovered the day after we, we found Darren's body. And uh, we would like to hear from anyone who saw those shoes between the 28th and the 30th of July in Antrim. Uh, they're a black size 9 Nike Air Max trainer with a very distinctive green stripe on them. Now, you're not sure whether he was killed on the Friday night or, or the Saturday morning, and, and obviously you want people who might have seen him. That's correct. We're, we're unsure of the exact time of Darren's death, but we do know that five hours before he died, he did eat a meal, and that meal contained um, either pork or beef. Now, if we knew where he obtained that meal, it would give us uh, the exact time of his death and give us more information about his movements. So if anyone saw Darren eating over the weekend that we're looking for, for the information, would you please contact us? Okay, and particularly to two people who wrote uh, anonymous letters, we need to find out who you are. Our number to the studio is free. Pre please ring us if you know what happened that night. Please help however minor you think your information. You can call the police in Antrim Direct. That's on 01232 259 659. It's a Belfast number, 01232 259 659. My goodness, the phones have been hot tonight. A very strong response on the minicab rape. Names are being put forward. And we've also had a response from victims who have been attacked, they believe, by the same man. One name has been put forward in the Julie Pacey murder and the Newcastle child abductions. Very strong information coming in from Newcastle and Darlington. Now, an unusual theft, at least unusual for Crime Watch, and that is of a rare bird, the peregrine falcon. This man was photographed near a nest by an English nature warden in Cross Fell near Penrith in Cumbria. He scurried off, abandoning his rope, hammer and a crowbar. A rucksack was later found at the bottom of the fell with a dead falcon chick inside. Now, if you know who he is, do give us a call, 0500 600 600. And that's the number, of course, if you can help with any of tonight's cases. Well, we'll be back in 50 minutes with a Crime Watch update. And you might like to know that Crime Watch Filed will be back next Tuesday with a full investigation on a case solved directly by Crime Watch viewers. Just before we go, I've got a series of pictures to show you. All of them so good, several hundred viewers must know who they are. First, this pair trying an armed robbery in Liverpool city centre. They're only about 18 years old. They fled empty-handed, but they had a gun, so don't hesitate to shop them. And who is this different pair of robbers? They attacked a building society in Colwyn Bay. One six foot, early 20s. The other is younger, about five foot eight. Police would like to add, there's a substantial reward. 0500 600 600. And here's a reminder of four of the faces that we showed you earlier. Top left, do you know this man? Next to him, Brian Fontaine. Bottom left is Christopher Harrison. And finally, this woman, who's she? And that's it for this month. If you have any information on any crime that we haven't featured, you can call Crime Stoppers, 0800 treble 5 treble 1, 0800 treble 5 treble 1. If you can't stay up for our update, do join us next month when Crime Watch returns on Thursday, the 2nd of November at 9.30. Finally, on behalf of victims and detectives, thank you for your help, thank you for watching. Don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Wembley, 7th of October, 1995. The scene is set for a battle of giants. That was absolute sheer class!
and nations prepare to contest the Rugby League World Cup. All eyes are on the opening clash between England Boys in, yes! and the reigning champions, Australia. Let battle commence. Kick off this Saturday at 3 on BBC One and Radio 5 Live. There's no escape. The Big Apple may be shiny on the outside, but what about its core? BBC One sent Clive James to find out. <laughs> 